afternoon to all of you uh, wonderful ladies. Thank you all for joining us once again. It's so great to see you all and we're massively grateful to our very special guest today, um, Harriet Green, for joining us from the Cotswolds in the UK. And I'm going to introduce Harriet in just one moment. Um, but I'd like to start by welcoming back our wonderful Women's Directorship Program alumni. Um, I know I always say this, but we are genuinely massively proud of all of our achievements. Half of you have now uh, serve on external boards as I know. Uh, uh, as INEDS, which is amazing. We're also super pleased to hear many of you have opted to join uh, joint venture and subsidiary boards of your own organizations. Something all of the speakers have spoken about as, gr as a great development for you. So uh, carry on doing that. Um, and many of you have been promoted or hired onto the group Exco uh, of your company or elsewhere. So congratulations to all of you. It's wonderful news. Um, keep sharing your news with us. The more representation we have at the top, uh, the more we can do uh, to change things. And in the words of Harriet herself, if we can see it, we can be it. Isn't that right, Harriet? <laughs> Absolutely. I totally believe that. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, in addition to our alumni, we're also pleased to welcome back our uh, the Women to Watch as part of the Hong Kong chapter of the 30% Club. Uh, as you all know, we've been supporting the Women's Foundation, whom we love working with and supporting these wonderful women um, for the last few years for the boardroom series. So welcome to you all, too. So on to the main event. Um, it's wonderful to have Harriet join us. Uh, welcome, Harriet. Great to see you. How are you? I'm wonderful. And thank you so much for giving me this wonderful opportunity to interact with the great and the good uh, that we need to get on all the top boards. So it's a real pleasure. Thank you. So well, it's, it's all our pleasure and we're really looking forward to this discussion and I'd just like to give you uh, a little bit of background uh, on Harriet and I'm sure uh, many of you have had a chance to have a look at her bio uh, in any case but um, up until uh, earlier this year Harriet was the chairman and CEO of IBM Asia Pacific based in Singapore, although now she lives back in her hometown of Cotswolds in the UK, and was previously the CEO of uh, Thomas Cook Group, following a very successful career in the electronics sector as the CEO of uh, Premier uh, Farnell and the president of APAC for Arrow Electronics. Harriet is currently on the boards of uh, Singapore uh, Economic Development Board and on the Advisory Council of King's College London, where she's also an alumni. Um, she was also uh, on the boards as an independent non-exec director for uh, Emerson e uh, Electric, as well as uh, BAE Systems. And Harriet Sir Roger Carr has also been a regular speaker on the programme for a number of years. So uh, we know how wonderful he is, I'm sure yeah. to work with. Um, Harriet was awarded uh, an OBE for her services uh, to electronics uh, back in 2010. Uh, but she has so many accolades and awards to even mention, but I'll mention a couple. She's been named uh, Heroes, 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 <laughs> however you want to say it, uh, Hall of Fame of 2020. And she's one of Fortune's most uh, powerful women internationally in 2019 and just yesterday was listed as one of UK's top 10 influences um, to follow on LinkedIn uh, for LinkedIn Voices, which is uh, fantastic. So you should follow her, her content is outstanding, wonderful, I love it. Um, in her own words, she's a businesswoman, wife, mother, daughter, sister, and a passionate lifetime learner. And as I mentioned to Harriet yesterday, once I learned about her most recent uh, award with LinkedIn, uh, you are a powerhouse of fabulousness. So, you know, we're very, very grateful uh, to have you in this session today. So welcome. Thank you. Um, wow, what an introduction. I think we should just stop there and move on. <laughs> God, I could have said so much more, but we, we want to hear from you. Um, I'd like to start, you know, by acknowledging that it has been an incredibly challenging year for, I'd say, pretty much every single one of us on this call right now. 
Um, for most of us, we've been working from home, but Harry, you've been doing something a little bit different right here. You've been keeping yourself just as busy as you always are and been volunteering for the NHS. Tell us about that. How, how has that been? Well, I think um, coming back from Singapore and, you know, a large business, 122,000 employees and 15 countries to be looking after, coming back into lockdown, um, I thought I should expend some of this energy in a, in a good way. So I applied to the NHS to be a volunteer. Um, I'm actually here in, in Oxford. Um, where I, where I live. I, I come from the Cotswolds. My mum is in the Cotswolds. But my first set of interviews for the NHS volunteering were harder than my interviews for IBM. Um, I wasn't qualified to help in the arts and crafts, the sewing division. My calligraphy wasn't good enough to write letters for the dying. And eventually I got work uh, delivering care packages and then creating a new approach to PPE, which saved quite a lot of money for the NHS. But I learned a great deal. I learned about people at the front line. Uh, I learned about the fifth largest employer in the world, the NHS. And I felt that I was, you know, giving something back, doing something that played to none of my strengths. Uh, and so I think it was good for me to do. Oh, that's wonderful. What a fantastic thing to have put your time and focus to and no doubt helped uh, many, many people that needed it in the UK. And, and you said what you learned in terms of about the NHS and you know what it does, but what did you learn about yourself in that process? So I think that, um, you know, both uh, uh, leadership and followership are, are kind of very important. You know, first of all, if you can do something, you probably should. I mean, I could have sat at home and read and wrote and done more yoga and more running. But I think if you can do something that helps in a time of crisis, you probably should. I learned that, um, you know, good leadership uh, can be both uh, of one or two. It doesn't have to be scaled to thousands. And I also learned that good followership is a skill that I haven't applied in, in, in a while. And uh, you can't kind of reshape the NHS on your own uh, uh, doing, doing volunteering. You have to pick a few battles, make a few changes, uh, but I, I learned a lot, I think, about the humility of doing things that you're really not very good at. I'm not very good at finding places, delivering things. I was very good at creating the wow when we delivered the packages, created new marketing, uh, new communications for the NHS. Uh, but um, I learned a lot, I think, mostly about humility, and that it doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing, good leadership comes down to one or two really great attributes that you can hone. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that story. And I know Harriet would like to keep this session as interactive as possible. So similar format to previous ones, Harriet and I will have a conversation and then uh, open it out to questions to you all. So do get your questions ready on chat and I will ask you um, to ask your com uh, question or, or make comments uh, to the group and to Harriet directly. Um, Harriet, I want to ask you a little bit about, uh, you know, as we have an all-female audience today, I mean, COVID has clearly forced all businesses to rethink the traditional uh, working environment. We've been forced into agile and flexible working, which isn't a bad thing in my view. For the first time, our professional and personal lives have really fused. How do you think this has impacted the prospect for women in the workplace? And do you see COVID as a positive accelerator for change or is it potentially holding us back? What's your view? So I, I think that um, we're at a vortex of change in the world, not just because of COVID. 
I mean, climate change, we've entered a new set of technology epochs, uh, whether it's cloud, AI, blockchain, security of our data, we are entering a new phase of, of technology. Uh, we have a, a crisis of inclusion, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, getting everyone to recognize your greatness because of your age, your sex, your color, your creed, your sexuality, your physical and cognitive, you know, ableism. And then of course a health pandemic. So I do believe uh, that this vortex of change is accelerating new ways of working. And my advice to both women and men is that more than ever, we need to have the skills that the world needs. Some of those are life skills. I get thoroughly pissed off when particularly men call them soft skills. Well, they would, wouldn't they? They don't have them mostly. Uh, um, you know, these are skills like, you know, EQ, collaboration. Breaking up ever so slightly. Every We're missing every fourth word. <laughs> Can you hear me? I can hear you. You're, I'm losing you on every fourth word, but you're not saying much. So I can dial back in if that helps, or I can sit here and say four words to an answer. <laughs> Let's keep going, and hopefully, if we, if it gets any worse, and I'm is anyone else having worse worse sound than I am? Because I'm only missing Anita, Ginny. Uh, uh, everyone is saying it's okay and suggesting it may be your connection. Okay, let's keep going then. Yeah? Yes. So what I was saying here was that I think at times of great change, a vortex of change, we need to have the skills that the world needs. And the first tranche of those are definitely life skills. The ones that I think women are particularly good at. Listening active asking, um, um, collaboration, uh, uh, really tuning in with EQ. And these are also skills that when we butt up against particularly AI and the huge technology changes, these are skills that are really required from humans. In a world of machines, it is those set of life skills that we are naturally, I think, good at, that we should be honing and developing, as well as the more specialized or technology skills that the world needs, whether that's, you know, data analytics, business analysis, understanding AI, you know, these are the skills of our time and I think it is a wonderful opportunity for us to learn them. Mm. I don't want to be too rosy. It is a terrible time. I learned how to be, and I'm not very good at it, a domestic violence counselor during lockdown. Uh, I think for many women, the poverty trap, the violence trap, the lack of learning and skills trap uh, is a big focus for me going forward around social mobility, particularly for women. And I would say for each of you, as you ascend in your careers, the privilege that you all have to be where you are, I know that, or I hope that you'll be giving back and, and thinking about how you can help pull 50 other women up to where you are too. But I think it's about skills at a vortex of change, Curti. Uh, and, and I'm glad to say that this particular group are very supportive of each other and other women. Um, and I know many of them do spend a lot of their time uh, trying to send the elevator back down and helping those that need it. So uh, we're, in a, we're in a very supportive group here, which is fantastic to hear uh, that you feel there are 
positives that can come out of this process and to embrace it and use our natural EQ and the ability to connect and be human as a positive rather than the others, uh, which is fantastic. I want to ask you a question a little bit about your board experience. And we have a lot of, um, a lot of women in this group who are currently executives as well as uh, being on boards as a non-exec. Um, and you've clearly served on large listed company boards uh, whilst being a CEO. Could you share with us some of the challenges you've had to overcome as you balance both your executive responsibilities with your non-executive responsibilities? What are the things that you've reflected or can share that will help us on our journey? Yeah, I think it's a great thing to do, be on a board whilst being an executive. I, 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 don't, I never really understood why people waited until they finished their executive career to be on a board. So I think it's a good thing to do because you learn to be, I think, a better executive by being a good board member. I have to start by saying, and I love Sir Roger Carr, I served on the BAE board as long as I could, the nine years. Uh, I served on the Emerson Electric Board in St. Louis for eight years until I joined IBM. And then we had conflict because the CEO and chair of Emerson sits on the IBM board. So we couldn't sort of oversee each other's pay, which is exactly right. Uh, but I think it makes you a better executive. But when I started, I wasn't very good at all at being an NED. Um, because I sort of thought it was like being an executive. <laughs> so I wanted to dive in and talk about how you run things. I wanted to talk about pace and, you know, people. And, and then I got some kind of feedback uh, uh, with a very experienced um, diplomat on the Emerson board, of course, a woman. Uh, uh, no man would have given me this feedback. Uh, and uh, she said, Harriet, you know, we don't really need another CEO of Emerson. We need Harriet Green yeah. uh, in all her, you know, meat on the bones um, to share her thoughts and views. You might stop trying to be the CEO and, and kind of bring an area of specialty to your advice. And it was brilliant. And I decided that there were really three areas of specialty to me. Uh, I love being on audit committees. I'm not a finance person, but I have been a public company CEO. And I think in audit committees, it's full of finance people and risk people, and it needs pragmatic business people, which I think I am. Secondly, on every single board I've shared, uh, even with an ally and a partner like Sir Roger Carr, inclusion and diversity at its core that because of someone's age and sex and color and creed and sexuality and the physical and cognitive ability it's because of who they are that we should be promoting uh, them and um, you know exploring their extraordinary poten uh, potential so that became a very big part of the advice that i gave and then also, also, very important as a quite a contrarian by nature, someone who's not very fearful of anything, but anything. it was often, often so key, it still is for me to say, yeah, I really hear where you're all going, gentlemen, or I hear where you're all going, Singaporeans or I hear where you're all going, but something in my gut just doesn't feel good about this. Or I feel passionately about this. I know none of you do, but this is why in a logical cognitive way. So the biggest thing that women like us can do on boards is not be afraid, not be petrified, of making that first input because all those glowery eyes look at you and they say, hmm, why did we add her? But our power is that we say, we've of course 
measure, intelligence, and thoughtfulness what's on our mind and in our gut. And of course, all the things that everyone else will say to you, prep well, allow good time, be a rock star. But I hope that very honest advice is useful to you. And I know that many boards and many headhunters, I'm the scourge of headhunters in the UK, mostly because I just think they divvy out jobs to their buddies and, and don't reach in a way that is powerful, unlike uh, uh, the team that we're with uh, 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 today. But I, I really, really feel that sometimes you get the reputation of being your own person, but that's fine. If they don't want more ag and they don't want Alison or they don't want Corinne and they don't want Margaret for who she is, then join something else, do something else. But being you with all your experience, all your knowledge, all your gut, all that got you to be an executive seven times better than any other guy that started with you as a minimum, that's what they want. So give them that nicely, politely, respectfully, but never be afraid. Fantastic. I love that advice. I really love that advice. Um, I know Giovanna wants to make a comment. Uh, who, so Giovanna, do you want to make your comment uh, before we go into questions in a few minutes after? Uh... No, no, I just, uh, I just uh, really applaud Harriet. Uh, uh, everything she shared, in particularly for the headhunter in UK, I do agree 200%. So thank you, Eric. Thank you so oh, much. It's, it's, you, you don't worry about that, really. You know, someone said to me last week, you know, you're a bit like Marmite. For those of you who've never eaten that shit. I mean, it's just like this salt-based extra. It's disgusting. But those who love it, love it. And I said, well, honestly, I don't know why you're wasting my time. He said, no, no, I happen to like Marmite. I said, I don't like your analogy. You know, so it's okay to be you. I mean, there's no point being destructive and impolite, setting women back 50 years. But as Roger Carr will tell you, when he, the person who he knew around that board table would say, honestly, Roger, I'm telling you the truth. We shouldn't do this. And this is why. Or, Roger, honestly, I don't think there's as much risk in this as everyone is saying. And being who you are doesn't mean everyone will always agree with you and learning how to gracefully say, I accept your view, <laughs> took me years to do that, um, uh, uh, is, is just fine. But uh, don't let that get to you. Being you is more important uh, in being selected for the right board than being liked, trust me. I agree with you. Can I just ask you, take advantage, ask you a question about, uh, uh, let's call it the multi-generational gap that we can have in a board, especially because I'm working quite a lot of innovation and uh, in startups and I have so much more fun and I have much, much more gratification working in a board with, uh, with millennials and Gen Z yeah. than to be honest, have with baby boomers or, and so on, yeah. which is their my peers. Um, what do you think about that? What do you also, because yeah. you talk quite a lot about uh, uh, inclusion, diversity. Yeah. yeah, it's a huge issue. And one of my purpose will announce next week, I'm doing something around missions beyond and social mobility is key and, and age is a big one for, for me. I think what we can learn from Generation Zers and what they can learn for us, this age diversity gap is often as big an issue, as big an issue as the diversity gap in companies. I did two things in Asia Pacific for IBM that were um, easy to do and very powerful. The first was that I gave every one of my 66 direct reports across the 15 countries a mutual mentee. So either a Generation Z or a millennial uh, where they shared um, life experiences and shared each other's skills. And with very few exceptions, they, they got stuff from it. Extraordinary stuff, like why Generation Zers feel it's necessary to change jobs every two years, speaking to someone who'd been 32 years at IBM. You know, those are different views and expressions. 
it worked very, very well. Suddenly my entire senior team got much better at cool social media uh, and uh, their digital selves. And my attrition rate in young graduates went down. The second thing I think is even more important and remarkably unpopular across most of Asia, certainly Hong Kong and the UK, Australia, I've seen some really good developments, um, which is around shadow boards. Picking an area, whether it's marketing or maybe uh, a new project around electricity generation or the new climate change initiative that a particular bank is undertaking and have the board of people or the advisory council who are gonna run it and have a shadow board of um, generation Zers and millennials uh, who will add, as you say, Giovanna, great, great insights and things that the, now not all of them are into implementable. I remember doing one big brainstorm on a particular problem and the collective wisdom of the Generation Zers uh, were to buy, was to buy uh, Amazon, uh, uh, which was not entirely affordable for IBM at the time. And they set out a great paper and, and a plan and it was all fun, but it doesn't mean that the other seven ideas of theirs weren't great. No. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, you've actually asked the question I was going to ask in a roundabout way. So that's that's fantastic, Giovanna. Um, I'm going to ask a question about leadership, Harriet, because of course, you know, you are known as a very inclusive leader. And clearly, you've just demonstrated with some of the uh, actions, interventions you put in place at IBM, uh, that this is really important to you. But there's, there's, you know, there's been a lot of discussion and great discussion and reflections on leadership during during this period of COVID. And you speak very passionately about the need for a growth mindset, uh, constantly challenging yourself, being this lifelong learner. Could you share with us your views on how leaders can be um, better agents for change? You know, being leaders for good, as opposed to just about profit maximization, it's more, you know, more holistic than that. Share, us, share your views on what you've been doing and how it's been playing out. Yeah, so this is not new to me. As my first CEO role at Premier Farnell, our strategy was around people, planet, and profits. And I think unless you align the motivations and the purpose of your workforce and have a strategy that is sustainable, uh, sustainable for the planet, sustainable in a strategic sense, it will be relatively short-lived. And I think there are some underlying psychological issues. I think as we get further and further up the executive tree to CEO, we seem to think that it's an inexorable mountain climb. And I don't think, at least for me, leadership and life is like that. I personally like to explore different industries, I know I like complex problems. It doesn't really matter what the sector is. I like to solve things that are quite intractable. I like Rubik's Cubes in, in that sense. So I think it is often fine and good to take a parallel step. And I'll give you a very good example. Uh, I think my work at Thomas Cook was some of the best work I've done as a leader in the three years transforming the mobile metrics, the digital, the workforce, the engagement, new clients, um, not taking the board with me or being as straightforward. I, I made it uh, uh, easier, I made it look easier than it was. The board thought that it was all done and that I was, you know, a constant, kind of pacey, aggressive person trying to sustain this change. And so it's essential to take a board with you. But after Thomas Cook, I said to myself, you know, honestly, Harriet, you don't know enough about a cloud construct. How could you buy AI if you don't really understand what it does? I was petrified my whole time at Thomas Cook that the 
security around the web environment was strong enough as we expanded users on mobile. And so when I left Thomas Cook, I was determined to take a role where I could give a lot, but also relearn. And so when I contacted Ginny Rometty, the then CEO and chairman at IBM, I said, I'll come and help you with change and transformation. She asked me to do one of IBM's very first organic startups, the Internet of Things. But in return, I need 60 hours a month on technology. I need to know, not, you know, I don't need to learn to code, but I need to understand the implications on business of this new epoch of technology. And for five years, that was our trade. I ran businesses and was a transforming force and I learned. So I think that it is very important to be open, to be humble and to be you. I cannot stress enough. I know I'm a very strong woman. You know, I lost a parent as a child. Um, I have been, I'm the eldest and so a dominant sibling in a sense to help my siblings through. But even for me, who's not a shrinking violet and not someone who actually cares that much what other people think of me, um, I, I don't mean by that that I don't care and I, I don't want to do good work, of course I do. But the headhunter who says you're like Marmite or that you're a left field candidate, I don't waste a second on that shit, I just move on. But even for me, there have been times when conforming and being part of the sort of, sort of floppy bow brigade and just bowing your head and thinking, well, the best thing I can do here is just be liked and be like the others. So the pressure to conform is huge. And I beg you to be yourselves, uh, to keep learning, and then to, to, you know, help as many people as you can. I mean, we can talk about legacy at some point, but that is the human condition. And I have a very strong sense, having said, I don't care what people think, what I mean by that is I don't care what people who don't rate me or, or don't want to hire me think. That's fine. That's their call. I might try a bit and persuade them, but I move on. And so I think that's very important. There's something in many women's genetic makeup, particularly in my own, you know, millennial children, where they so want to be liked and so want to be part of a Gaia that accepts them. And even my youngest often says, oh, I'm glad you did that, but I probably wouldn't have done myself. And I want to give her that gene that goes, uh, uh, she never will. That's not in her makeup. I love that. You know, please don't change. I love the fact that you call things out, whether you're going to be liked or not for saying those things. That's what makes you very special. And actually, I do want to ask you about your legacy before we talk, hand it over to the ladies to ask their questions to you directly. Um, but what what legacy do you hope to leave and what comes next for Harriet Green? So I, I hope you all took a moment to look at the new website, HarrietGreen.com, because I wanted to answer that question in a simple new age website. I mean, I think first of all, my legacy is to other women who I spend a great deal of time coaching, helping, supporting, that it is fine to be you. Uh, I've been a left field candidate most of my life. I've been someone that people come to when others can't fix things, which has been the role of women in business for at least a decade. Uh, if a man could fix it, they would have chosen him. Uh, uh, so we often get the tougher roles, but that's great. Then we can really demonstrate our wondrousness. Never underestimate your influence for good. I think there is a really horrible, special place in hell let, you know, for women who don't help other women. Um, I mentor, coach, get exasperated, uh, try and help uh, women, young, medium, older, every single day and learn from 
uh, uh, other women. And I think my legacy is also about, you know, learning to love living life. This last year, you know, I've, I've done more that I've wanted to do physically in my running, jumping, skipping, uh, uh, creatively in my writing and reading. And now having, you know, making purposeful impact. The work that I do will be around coalitions that can affect major problems that the world has that are captured in the UN compact, whether it's social mobility, whether it's poverty, I think I can help with those things uh, hugely. Wonderful. Thank you, Harriet. Is, we have a question from May. May, would you like to ask your question directly? Okay, just unmute it. Actually, um, happy for you to ask it, Kurti. <laughs> Why don't you do it as you're online? Come on. <laughs> you're never. <laughs> First of all, Harriet, you are so refreshing. Thank you <laughs> for being you, as you've asked, yes, you've said for us to be. Um, but relative to ageism, I do actually think this is a huge problem. And I, I, I fare from California, but I've been living in Asia for many years. And I think that culturally in Asia, um, there's a lot of care for the elderly. Um, mm -hmm. And people are not generally left to alone or destitute. But I think in the US in particular, it's a real issue. And it's been highlighted, especially with COVID, um, because you see how many um, families have had to leave uh, their elderlies in um, the homes. And clearly, they were one of the first to, to um, be infected and, and pass away without even having your loved ones. But then there are many, especially given automation and innovation, and there's increasing chasms. And it, for example, it's far easy. I, I invest in the technology sector and I also follow just about every new, new thing. <laughs> I'm curious about that. But um, I can see that um, even for myself, who've been following innovations for many years, that there's such an, uh, an accelerated pace for which innovation is increasing that um, for anyone um, who's not a dig digital native, it could be a challenge to adapt. And clearly in the workforce, so it's easier to hire somebody in their 20s or 30s who are highly skillful and who could be highly efficient than to hire somebody who might be in their 50s or above, even though they're not ready. So May, these hire. are, May, May, these are great, great inputs. Very, be, I want to, no, 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 just be, just be sharp with the question. What, what can I answer for you? I, I agree totally with everything you said, but I don't think it's my agreement you're looking for. So no. give me a, a verb, an adjective, and a noun on the question. So, so as um, uh, someone on the board, how would you bridge that gap for companies? Because well, I, I think that um, as I've already mentioned, I encourage boards to have shadow boards, uh, to have mutual mentoring, not just upward mentoring. And another thing that I always do, and Roger Carr at BAE was fantastically good at embracing this, when we ask for people from the executive team to come in and present to us, I always ask for the hypos, for the younger generation, the young managers, the newer members uh, who um, I always say, of course, could you make sure they're women as well and, and people of color and if we know who are LGBT, uh, LGBT plus, you know, let's let's get diversity into this boardroom in as many ways as we can. And he was wonderful on that. But I think that um, the young people are being hired, but the older ones are being phased out. I think that's much more an issue in North America. I think in Asia, as you say, there's much deeper respect for age. But the shadow boards interacting with mutual mentees, 
uh, I think in America has also demonstrated to those who had a sort of lifelong view of their tenure at a company that they too have to change. And so the mutual mentoring, I think, has had a mu as much impact on the older generation saying, you're right, I need a digital footprint. I need a digital, I need to get with the program and with the times. And I think, again, making sure, uh, and certainly did this a lot at IBM, that someone who was on the first AI program 50 years ago has got more to teach us than some of us will ever learn. You know, we have to lose that age lens, May. I totally agree. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Thanks for your question, May. Um, we seem to have a very quiet group today. Who, who'd like to ask the next question? Can I ask another one, please? Not on the chat. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> who'd like to ask the next question? Ivana's saying, I, I think... Um, yeah, um, can I just ask another one? Um, Harriet, just, uh, I have a, a, would you like your opinion about uh, uh, coming back for what May just mentioned um, about, re, let's say, upskilling or reskilling a certain category of, uh, you know, let's say, seniors from middle management, maybe 20 to 25 years experience up to date that, uh, you know, they, they have to know a little bit more about technology, at least the to, to understand, like you just mentioned, not yep. necessarily to be a coder, but definitely to understand. And what I noticed is, um, I, I know that it's from the board to everyone else, the first cut of the budget is training, it's training, mm -hmm. upskilling, yeah. this kind of parts. So what is your advice in terms of how we can make an effective cause within the board where something like this happen because as a women we believe in training in development and learning yeah i i think often um training and development is not about expensive programs you know putting people together the best most experienced business analyst with a new young project manager the mutual mentoring and learning is enormous. So I think there is a great deal we can do inside of companies relatively cost effectively to match skills and match learning and match development. Secondly, it is a very short term business that isn't investing <laughs> on leadership and development right now because we all have to relearn as leaders. I've been watching, for example, a series and learning. One of my closest colleagues I'm now uh, working with daily, Manny Ahmadi. Um, and I, I've been watching a series about conversations with a black man. Uh, uh, in Asia Pac, I didn't have as many conversations with black men as I did with Indonesian, Korean, uh, Indian men. And so it is our responsibility uh, and I think taking to the board table, we've got to be equipping our leaders to be having the training and the development that will allow them to cope with climate changes, inclusion and diversity changes, health, working from home and hybrid working changes, uh, and of course, technology. It's all of them. So leadership training you know, if I'm on a board, which I am at King's, and we've done so much to change the curriculum, there is no choice. Every leader must be re-equipped. I think I'm a pretty good leader, but my conversations with black men needed a lot of work, as an example. No, fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Giovanna. Um, and one of the things, Giovanna, we've been doing with our clients is actually bringing our clients together. So this cross-fertilization and sharing and connectivity between different companies as also a way of uh, sharing and learning from each other. So that's been very effective uh, within our smaller community uh, in Asia. We have a question from uh, Corinne. Hi, Corinne. Hi. Um, it, it just uh, the, the earlier discussion about sort of the makeup of the board just triggered something in me. Um, Harriet, I work for an old school utility 
that's busy transforming itself into what we call the utility of the future. And one of the things that I think would be helpful is to understand in companies which you've worked in that have gone through innovation or transformation activities, has there been a change in the way that the boards actually approach these issues? So, you know, has there been sort of a chance to modify the governance process or the decision-making process? Yeah, I think that's a really super question, Corinne. I think, and it's something that I've been saying all year, um, which makes me very unpopular with headhunters. I will not join a board where there are not, where there is at least not one other woman and at least two other transformers. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean people who have done great digital transformations or, or uh, a major business change or a major acquisition or expansion that has either been good or failed. And I'll give you an example. I won't name the company as it's unfair, but they wanted, uh, were interviewing me to uh, be the senior independent director. And this is a company that uh, it's not exactly in your world, but it is a quite an old world business. And, um, you know, it was quite a, it was a prestigious top 20 company. And on the board, there wasn't a single person who had ever transformed anything. They were the sort of, you know, Boris Boy elite, old conservative, Etonian. I mean, it was monstrous. And, and those elites exist certainly in Hong Kong, mm. certainly in Singapore. They exist certainly in India, everywhere. And, and there was one other woman that, no, I, there was one other woman. However, I said, I'm absolutely not joining because how is this company going to be successful taking all my experiences from Thomas Cook if the chairman and the rest of the board basically think, oh my Lord, that's an awful lot of change. Thank goodness she's reached the end of it now. We can get rid of her. She's so annoying uh, and so fast and so completely infuriating and upsets everyone. And, you know, we've hardly got anyone left from the old travel world. Well, of course you haven't because travel failed to keep up with the times. So I do think the makeup of the board, the nominations committee, uh, of course, headhunters hate this. They just want to appoint their chums mm -hmm. and the people they owe something to or those safe hands that guarantee a good fee. So I think the role of the board when there is a transformational agenda, Corinne, is fundamental. And the questions to be asking uh, uh, um, are, you know, who on the board has succeeded and failed? And failure is just fine on a transformation uh, as well as success. Um, who's not part of the old world? If everyone on the board, you know, knows old world extraction or old world telco or old world utilities, you ain't gonna get change with that poor CEO. It's not gonna happen. You need that change to come in a 360 way, Corinne. Does that make sense? Yeah, very much so. Thank you. That's a great question, Corinne. And Harriet, you know this world as well as the rest of us. Unfortunately, there are many companies still in the old mold that want to transform, but still battling with, you know, how does it look? How does it feel? And not willing to take the uh, advice from those that potentially uh know a lot more and, and and can certainly advise through that transformation but we we continue to battle with those same questions um but anyway we have a question from uh atia yes hello hi harriet um very interesting discussion and conversation i wanted to pick your brain on how have you prepared uh for your board positions in terms of managing the political risk that an organization faces, and especially relevant given the changing landscape with US hegemony uh, sort of being taken away and Asia coming up as a counterweight to US? That's a great question, Atia. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a very important aperture and lens to view your board appointments. In fact, I nearly didn't take the BAE board role 
because I don't really like government. Uh, I don't really like the people, at least in the democracies I know that get appointed uh, uh, to positions of high office on the whole. And I didn't know if I would be an ally or an asset or helpful on the board. It wasn't Sir Roger Carr who was the chairman then, it was uh, another knight of the realm. And um, I think it, 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 I'm glad I did it, not least because it's world-class manufacturing, fighter jets, warships, and creating uh, a deterrent, which I think does help safety and security in the world. But I think being cognizant of the political impact, whether it's a, a security and defense company, I think it's a very interesting lens. Personally, I love being an international citizen of the world, understanding uh, one of the countries I love most in the whole world, India, uh, a country I happen to be very fond of, uh, China, um, uh, and, and understanding in the Middle East, in South Africa, you know, understanding the positioning of the company that you're hoping to join's position in the world is a very interesting lens. Um, and it taught me a great deal uh, uh, that you don't get in just a commercial uh, uh, sector. So the preparation that I did to answer your question, Aditya, is, you know, I, I researched thoroughly I listen to, you know, different boards and, and uh, sorry, different podcasts. I read extensively. And of course, being at IBM that had hard sites in 147 countries, I would, you know, pick up the phone to their general manager of Ghana or Sub-Saharan Africa uh, or Jordan uh, or Israel and understand what was happening. I personally like being uh, uh, international. It works for me. I have no desire to just think in a sort of closed, fixed, old mindset. Help? Yes, Does that thank help, you. Aditya? Yes, yeah? thank you. Yes. My pleasure. Good Great. question. Thank you. Um, Maria's got a hand up. Hi, Maria. How are you? Hi, Guilty. Hi, Harriet. Um, uh, thank you, Harriet, for uh, your inspirational conversation. Uh, my question is, due to these unprecedented times with the COVID-19 and the macro trends accelerating as digitalization, sustainability, uh, inclusion and diversity, are the companies pressuring to refresh their boards? And how is affecting the actual composition of the boards? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's another super question. I think it's an opportunity for all of us, all of those, all of those of you who are looking to join a, a board based on the circular conversation we've had here, which couldn't have been planned better. Any board that is not looking for deeper inclusion and diversity is a board that you don't want to be a part of anyway. So fight for positions in companies that are thinking boy, I need someone from a different age category, someone from a different sector, someone who can help us cope with. So find your area of specialty. Do you know stuff that will help companies with their climate change? Do you know stuff that will help companies with their technology? Uh, do you know stuff that will help people a lot with their inclusion, diversity, their social mobility metrics and being you know, a basically good company going forward? And, and do you know something about a brilliant pandemic response that will help companies in managing their risks going forward? So I, I would hone your CVs and skills around your specialty in those areas. And I would bet my bottom dollar that you will get opportunities and, and focus on those that, really want you for who you are, not, you know, to tick a box uh, uh, and to have you be quiet and well behaved. 
<laughs> I can't imagine any of this group would be uh, uh, happy to be quiet and uh, be well behaved because uh, they all have plenty of things to share and uh, certainly uh, learn from each other. We have sadly run out of time and I know Anita and Bonnie, you both had questions. But I'm hoping the, uh, the question previous actually answered some of that for you in any case. Um, but, you know, we have run out of time and, and it's, you know, just leaves me to say a huge thank you to Harriet for her inspiration, her wisdom, her leadership, and for continuing to use your voice and your influence for good, which is, you know, which is fantastic. But before we wrap up, Harriet, is there any, are there any last words you'd like to share with this group? Well, I, I just, I was so engrossed in the questions and answers. I've just seen that there are some great questions here. Uh, um, uh, that I haven't answered um, from from people. So I, I do apologize. I wasn't focused on the chat. I was focused on you. But uh, if if after this, there's anything you want to ask me, you know, you can reach me at hg at harrietgreen.info. You know, my my greatest advice to you really is be you. You know, you're all amazing women who've got to these positions by working hard, being spectacular, better than the other guys, be you. Breathe life into who you are. Don't be defined, uh, uh, don't let yourself be defined by others. Don't be as difficult and as, you know, just difficult as I was in my early days, not realizing that there were many great men that you've had, uh, whether it's Gordon or Sir Roger or whoever, that actually are fighting for us and championing in our cause. I didn't embrace male role models till middle of my life. I should have done that earlier, but be you. And if I can ever help you in any way, uh, I'm here for you. So thank you for inviting me, Curti. You are a bit of a legend yourself. Not only are you delightful, you're so kind to people. You're so beautifully female in every sense. And you know, you should carry on doing what you do too. I love you to pieces. Oh, that's so kind of you, Harriet, for saying that. I'm going to take that with me. Thank you so much. Um, we hope when things are back to normal, whatever that means, and we can actually travel, no doubt Asia is in your heart. So you may hopefully come in this direction. We can do this all again, but with a glass of wine and in person, we hope at some point soon. Please let us host you next time. Uh, all right. Thank you so much, guys. Lovely to talk to you. Before we go, um, one last thing, to, uh, 2021 WDP, if anybody wants to make any recommendations, let us know. And then our next WDP alumni event is on the 1st of December with Sir Donald Bryden. So please join. He can't wait to see you all again, um, obviously this time virtually, but a huge thank you to Harriet once again. Um, and everyone stay safe and take care. Bye. Yes, indeed. Enjoy. Take care, guys. Lovely. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Okay. Nice. If you can't.